you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we save us and he was everything that we needed and he did everything that was necessary for us to have eternal life everything necessary for us to have an abundant life and he's worthy of our praises and you can't really praise him until you understand what he did for you on the cross you could have a a, 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 a force yourself kind of praise 
but a I can't help but praise him kind of praise is what you have when you figure out what he really did, when it really sinks in. Amen. Uh, today we're going to begin our uh, verse by, uh, by verse study in Colossians, and uh, we'll just be going over the, the introduction and the greeting today. Colossians chapter 1, we'll be reading verse 1 through verse 8. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't think you can get much out of the greeting, uh, but there's a lot to be said about how Paul loved these churches and how he viewed them and how he treated them and, uh, and how we should view each other and how we should treat each other and how we should look at each other. Just in this greeting itself gives us an example of how to treat each other. And uh, that's what we're going to be going over today. So if you've got your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, uh, we'll be reading uh, 1 through 8. Is everybody there? For those who are able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> and if I get any of these words wrong, it's okay, I promise. We'll make it through it. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, her brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Coloss. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bring Bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come before you today, God. God, so thankful for what you did for us at the cross. So thankful, God, that when we were your enemies and, and we were blinded and we had no idea who you were, neither did we care. You still came and sacrificed your life for us. And we're so thankful for that today, God. And we're thankful for your resurrection power, God, that you've, you've given us. One day we're going to be with you, God. We know we're just in this earth for a little while, God, but we have purpose in this earth. And it is to spread your love, to share your love, to show your love. But, God, we need your love to be able to do that, God. And we need your word. Your word is where we find you. Your word is where we see you. Your word is where we learn about you, God. So teach us today, God. Push me to the side and send your Holy Spirit to teach these eight verses, God. I can't, but you can't. And we know that you will because you desire us to know more about you. And we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory for everything that you do do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> And like I said, in this, uh, in this greeting, you can learn a lot uh, about Paul's love. And we talked about Paul's love in, in the book of uh, Philippians. But we're going to go uh, uh, a little deeper uh, here into it. And before we start, you got to remember that this was written uh, just about the same time uh, the book of Philippians was wrote. Probably a different messenger uh, carried this letter. But it was uh, about the same time. So let's look at verse 1. <clears throat> It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And we know that he included Timothy too. Which, you know, Timothy was, was uh, uh, his discipleship. He was preparing Timothy uh, to keep doing what he had already done. 
And uh, uh, before we move on, that should be one of our number one priorities is instilling in our youth what we've learned so that they can carry on what we know. Because if what we know in the truth vanishes due to uh, non-discipleship, then what kind of world will our children and grandchildren live in if it ends with us? And Paul knew the importance of it, so he took Timothy under his wing, no doubt inspired by God. I'm sure Paul, God told Paul to do it. I'm sure that God led Timothy to Paul. And we talked about Timothy in the book of Philippians, so we won't go into that. But you'll notice he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And any calling that you take on, uh, for you to be able to be what that calling requires, you have to be called of God. There's a lot of times you'll see in the church where, where people are not called of God and they're in a position. And you'll see in some of these larger churches now where they do uh, background checks and all this before they'll put people into position. And I understand a lot of these bigger churches, man, that would be overwhelming to try to keep up with all these people. But if they're called for the position, you wouldn't have the problems that you run into which caused the churches to have background checks. And I look here, that could happen here. But in a bigger church, that's harder to keep up with. But the bottom line is when we are called by the will of God to a certain position, then we can fulfill what that position requires. And only that. If Paul wasn't called uh, uh, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, then I doubt you would even be reading about him today. And if you did, it probably wouldn't be nothing to study. Uh, verse 2 says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, so we know that he's writing uh, to the Christians. And in this instant, he is writing to the, uh, to the Colossian uh, church. Now keep in mind, later in this study, uh, we'll see some things that the, the Colossians were doing wrong, some problems uh, that they had. But keep in mind as we go through the rest of this greeting that they did have problems and they were not perfect. And they had a couple serious problems. But I want you to, to remember and keep in mind how Paul addresses them and how he treats them even though they're not perfect. Do you have Christian friends that ain't perfect? Have you ever treated them wrongly because they weren't perfect? That happens, don't it? Well, we're going to learn how not to do that uh, right here. But in verse 2, he was writing to the Christians, and he writes, Grace and peace be unto you. Grace be unto you and peace. And where does it come from? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you that you can have grace and not have peace. But you can't have peace without grace. You can have a false sense of peace, but you're really not at peace until God's grace is manifested in your life. Because without His grace, hell's going to be your home and there's nothing peaceful about that. You may be content where you are in this life, but you won't be when you take your last breath. You'll be upset that you didn't experience grace so that you can have true peace. But you can have grace without peace. And grace without peace is having grace without knowing grace. And you'll see a lot of Christians have that. They'll have grace in their life. They're saved, but they don't fully understand grace, so they don't have peace because they didn't understand the grace that they had. Does that make sense? So it's important that we constantly learn about His grace. You read in the Bible many times uh, where someone is praying for someone else to grow in grace. And that's what that means. The more we learn about God's grace, the more peace that we can have in our life. And I don't know about you all, but I desire peace. When I don't have it, I don't like it. I like peace. Even if everything's falling down around me, the peace is what's important. It doesn't matter if everything in your life can be together, can be perfectly built together. But if you don't have peace, it means nothing. It means nothing. So we can have grace and not have peace, and we don't want to do that. See, we were separated from the God of peace, 
but we were reconciled through Jesus Christ. So even though the peace comes from God, it takes our Lord Jesus Christ for that grace to be established in our life because we were separated because of our sin, but Christ paying the penalty for our sin uh, allowed us to be reconciled to the God of peace, which makes peace available to us. Now this is important as we move on in these next verses. Verse 3. Now keep in mind this church wasn't perfect. And they had a couple of serious problems going on. And probably some more that Paul didn't know about and didn't write about. Uh, just like every church. Every church has its problems. If you're looking for a perfect church to attend, uh, you're going to have to wait till we're raptured. Because you'll not find one in this life. We all have mistakes. But in verse 3 it says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So he's giving thanks for them and praying for them even though they're not perfect. Even though they're not perfect. This church has some problems, but it could not prevent Paul from being thankful for them. Nor would it prevent him from praying for them. Have you ever been aggravated with somebody that wasn't perfect and it prevented you from praying for them? I'm going to tell you here in a little bit about a trap that you'll fall in because I fell in it and I fell in it not too long ago. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But being thankful for each other as well as, as, well as praying for one another is important. How many believes it's important? We can't be unified if we can't do that. Because what happens when the God of peace is not activated in your life or you have grace, you have grace in your life but no peace, so the opposite of peace is what? War. Who you war with? Everybody else. And that's what will happen in your life. And it will happen subconsciously. You'll wake up one day and you'll just be mad and you won't know why. That's because you lack peace. You may be saved. Grace may be there, but you don't understand grace. So what enabled Paul to be thankful for them, even though they weren't perfect, and to pray for them, even though they weren't perfect? Grace and peace. Coming back to, uh, to verse 2 when he says, grace and peace. Be added unto you. He's praying for grace and peace, for them to experience grace and peace. And it was God's grace and God's peace that enabled him to give thanks for somebody, even though they weren't perfect. Maybe somebody's wronged you in here today. The only way that you can still love them and be thankful for them and pray for them is if you have God's grace and His peace. You can have His grace and subtract His peace due to uh, not understanding His grace. And you're still not going to be able to pray for these people. You're still not going to be able to be thankful for them. And the whole time you're destroying unity in the church and allowing the adversary to get in and cause us not to be the light that we're supposed to be. Does that make sense? So it all comes back to His grace and peace. I'll give you an example of uh, grace without peace is King Saul when he was upset with David. The anointing was on Saul's life. He was anointed king. God was with him, but he lost his peace. And he lost his peace uh, because of pride and some other things. But the very one that probably helped him the most. I mean, Saul was, uh, uh, was, was tormented at one time by evil spirits. I mean, he was battling with depression and anxiety. That was real depression and anxiety. And David would come in and play the harp and they would leave. But Saul never really could appreciate David because of his jealousy. Because he was at war with him. Because he wasn't experiencing God's peace. Grace was in his life, but peace wasn't there. David went out and killed armies for Saul. Grace was there, but peace was absent. And this can happen to you. It can happen in our church. And it can tear our church slap apart if we're not constantly focused on God's grace and His peace. Verse 4. Now this is the reason that Paul gave that he was thankful for them. It says, Since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all saints. 
So as Paul's heard, and we know, uh, we'll read later here that he heard it from Epaphras. So he had got word of, of how uh, loving the Colossians were and, and about their faith. Uh, so this is one thing that he was thankful for them for, that they had faith and they were showing their love. And there's always something that you can be thankful for in someone else. Look here, none of us is perfect. And we talked about this before in our uni unity study. Uh, we're a diversity in a unity. You know, we're all different, but it's supposed to be that way. We should be in one mind, one accord, focusing on things of Christ and working together, but we're different. My strengths are not your strengths. Your strengths are not my strengths. But when we work together, we can overcome this. So the adversary's plan is to take our peace so that we'll be at war with every member of the church instead of being at peace with them and working together. And this is the adversary's plan to get in. If, if the adversary had got a hold of Paul here, he would not be thankful for this church. But you see, because of God's grace and peace in Paul's life, he was thankful for this church. So there's, be in mind, there's always something you can be thankful for, even who you feel is your enemy in the church. If you'd really look at it and evaluate it, there's something that they can help you with. There's something that they've already helped you with. But we all, through the Word, should have faith and peace, shouldn't we? Everybody in here has got a measure of faith, don't they? Everybody in here, uh, I look around, everybody in here is saved, so God's grace is established in our life, and we all have some sort of faith, and we all have love. So there is something that each and every one of us should be thankful about in each and every person in here. Each and every person in here. Verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now this is, we're going to get into why that there is peace. Uh, once again, something happened for something else to happen here. Uh, for them to have faith and love for all the saints, uh, they first had to have the hope that verse 5 is talking about here. And a lot of people misinterpret this, and uh, you hear some other uh, denominations that talk about their hope, and it's not the hope that the Bible says that we should have. Uh, a lot of times they compare uh, the hope that Christ gives us to a hope that is in the world. And I'll give you an example, and I'm sure most of you guys will enjoy this example. Uh, but we'll say that I'm hoping that the West Virginia Mountaineers win the national title this year. Wrong kind of hope. Wrong kind of hope. This hope has no substance. Even if I have hope Alabama wins, how many knows how good Alabama win, uh, is this year? Even if I have hope that Alabama wins the national championship, my hope, my hope is based on everything going perfect, perfect, which may or may not occur. But our hope in Christ has substance. And the substance of our hope is faith. And if salvation is a gift of God, not of works by us, then our hope rests on Christ and whether He does everything perfect, which already did happen. So if I get on the West Virginia train, I may or may not see my hope become a reality and win. But if I'm on the Jesus train, then my hope is in His work and it's already finished at the cross, so I do win. Does that make sense? So in this hope in verse 5 gives us the peace that God give us through Jesus Christ at the cross because He's already won for us. And when we fully understand this, then we can have love for brothers and sisters. Does that make sense? I thought that was awesome. Go Mountaineers. They're going to win it, I hope. <laughs> Also in verse 5, uh, Paul was thankful this hope was established in their life. Are you thankful when your brothers and sisters in Christ finally figure this out? That you're saved. When they finally figure out what Christ did for us. I could sit and, you know, and I still don't know a, a portion of it. But the more I learn about what he did for me, I could just sit and cry. Church, we was going to go to hell. We had no hope. And not only did He save us, but He uses us for His glory. He manifests His kingdom in our life. 
Is that not beautiful or what? And we didn't deserve any of it. None of it. But Paul was thankful this hope was established in our life because it enabled them to have faith. And love, therefore, allowed them to reflect grace and peace to others, which is what Paul was doing. It's what he was doing with Timothy. That's why he was successful in discipling Timothy and getting Timothy uh, to the place where he was. Now, how did this happen? God provided them access to his son, and they learn about it through the word of truth, and it supernaturally developed. So that's why it's important that we take our Bible study and our personal study uh, very important because that is where we learn the truth and that is where the truth supernaturally changes us more like Christ. That's my desire. I'm taught as each step. He's a figure. But man, our Lord and Savior, He's awesome, man. And I want to be more like Him. Verse 6, this is what they're learning. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 said, which is coming to you as, as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Since the day ye heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. So the gospel will bring forth fruit when it is heard and when it is known. And that's a process. A lot of people hear it, but not everybody knows it. I may hear that Kentucky beat Florida yesterday, but I didn't believe it. It's kind of hard to believe. <laughs> but once I seen it on TV that they had actually won, I knew it. So it sunk in that it was actually true. The problem is a lot of people hear it and it doesn't never sink in. Therefore, it does not bring forth fruit. And one more turn to Mark chapter 4. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read this parable to you. And I know you've heard it before. But this is an example of hearing and knowing. And this is Jesus speaking in a parable. He says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, uh, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on, the, on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundredfold. He said, He that hath ears, uh, let him hear. And he goes on to explain uh, what the parable is, uh, what the parable means. He said, "Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them." And this is when he explains it. He said, "Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the." Word. So here we go. The Word of God, the Word of truth, the gospel is going to bring forth fruit. Now let's see what happens here. It says, And these are they by the wayside where the Word is sown. But when they heard it, Satan uh, uh, cometh immediately and taketh away the Word that was sown in their hearts. So they heard it, but they didn't know it. So this planting didn't produce fruit. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward. And when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word." And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So this is hearing the word, 
but not knowing it. It not taking root. It not really sinking in. This is learning or hearing that Kentucky won, but you never go and check it out. You never uh, keep pressing in. You never turn the TV on to verify. You never dig a little deeper into the situation, and it doesn't produce fruit. It has no root, and it just goes away. You see, some people do that. They'll come to church and, and then they'll be gone before you know it and you never see them again. That's what this happens. They knew it. The Bible says even the devils believe. Most people's heard it, but not everyone knows it. It goes on to say, and, and these are they which are sown on good ground, on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. So they heard it, and now they know it. They heard it, they dug into it, and it changed their life. Amen? That's when fruit starts to be seen. And receive it. And bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. So there's a difference in just knowing, and uh, or a difference in hearing, and hearing and knowing. So what do we know? What are we hearing and what are we knowing? What do we need to believe to, to understand grace and have this peace? I'm going to read you 2 Thessalonians 2.16. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope, not bad hope, good hope through grace. Good hope. Not a West Virginia Mountaineer hope, not a UK hope, but a Jesus Christ hope. He's already done this for you, and it was God's grace that handed this beautiful gift to you. And we know that. It's a good hope. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Zeke Step, Jeremy Smith. Yourself, enter your name here. Is any of that true? It's in Christ Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus. That is where the peace comes from. That is where your ability to love somebody else comes from. That is where your ability to be thankful for your brother in Christ, even though they ain't perfect and they may have done your own. Because what happens if all this isn't established in your life and you don't really uh, allow the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, to come into your life because we're not taking uh, our word time seriously and we're just, uh, uh, just uh, being uh, uh, slow about our uh, process of, of taking the word in and learning more about Christ and we don't fully understand, we are here to help each other. And I'll tell you about a trap that I I feel him. Uh, you know the scripture, and I've preached on it before. So this tells me a lot. Of, sometimes I don't practice what I preach, but I'll be the first to admit it to you. The scripture that says, "If a brethren be overtaken by a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted." There was a time that I passed up opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to help somebody. And before I knew it, I'd fell in the same trap he was in. And then we were both in that trap. And who was going to help us? And it wasn't until that moment that I realized that, man, I should have helped a long time ago. I should have helped a long time ago. So that verse came true in my life. And unless we understand God's grace that even when we didn't deserve it, He gave us this. He gave us this. Then we're not going to be able to be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they ain't perfect, and go and help them anyway, and pray for them anyway. You don't want to fall in that trap. And we don't have to. We've been given a way of escape, and that's through Jesus Christ. And when we follow after Him, then we can act like Him, and we don't have to fall in this trap. But once we hear and know the gospel, it begin, begins to produce fruit in our life. We all agree with that? Can you see the fruit in your brother or sister's life? Can you see their mistakes too? We all make mistakes. Ain't none of us are perfect. 
but we should be able to be thankful that there's faith in each and every one of us, that God's grace is established in our life, and we should love, we should be able to love. Not making yourself love, but just love. There's a difference. There's a difference. You can somehow make yourself act like you love somebody, but the more that you learn about Christ and what He actually did for you, the more that you're just going to love. It's going to come natural. But once we hear and know the gospel, it begins to produce fruit in our life. Uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, we studied this a long time ago. He says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. So don't be satisfied with how much you love now. You can love more. You can love more. And Paul's praying that the Philippian church here would love more. Uh, their love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So it takes the knowledge of the one who is love to be able to love. That ye may approve things that are excellent. Or you may practice what you preach. You tell somebody something and you don't do it, then you're not approving it. You're making it look bad. And a lot of times the church does that with Jesus Christ. We'll make Jesus look pitiful because of how we act. Because that we don't love each other and we fight each other. But that we, ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Ain't that beautiful? We'll go over verse 7 and 8. We're almost done. Verse 7 says, as, uh, as ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So even though he was a faithful minister, he was also a fellow servant. So we're all on the same team. You ain't no better than me. I ain't no better than you. The singer ain't no better than the drummer. And on and on. The person in the back of the church ain't no better than the person in the front of the church. Uh, and Paul's saying here, as you have learned from me and you respect my teaching, uh, learn from him too. He's a faithful minister. So Paul is really putting his approval on him. He's putting his approval on him. He said, Epaphras was for you. He's for you. He's for you. So your pastor, and I can see that this guy was more, more or less a spiritual leader in this church, probably their pastor. He was for them. Verse 8 says, Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now this wraps it all up. This has a lot to do with why Paul approved this man. Because this man was bragging on him. So that tells me that he felt awesome that they were doing good. Just as Paul felt awesome when he learned that they were doing good. So this showed Paul that this man has love. This man has grace, peace. He understands what's going on. He loves this church. I approve him. I approve him. Because he's seen the same things that God had already blessed him with. Any questions? Circle prayer.